So we're continuing Wilfred Grenfell, Chapter 13, Adrift. By 1905, the work in Labrador and Newfoundland was growing by leaps and bounds. The Mission Council had dropped any plans to have Wilfred return to England and carry on his work with the mission there. Wilfred Grenfell was now as much a part of the Labrador coast as any fisherman who have, had been born and raised there, and he never wanted to leave the place again. With the hospital at St. Anthony now well established, Wilfred had made that community his winter headquarters. During the summer months, he took the Stratconia and served the Stratcona and served the fishing fleet and those living in the most remote areas of Labrador and Newfoundland. The hospitals at Battle Harbor and Indian Harbor were extended and a string of nursing stations was established along the coast. A hardy nurse manned each station through the winter and a succession of volunteers, medical students, and nurse staff, nurses staffed them in the summer. These volunteers were Wilfred's pride and joy. He called them WOPS, WOPS, which stood for Workers Without Pay. Every time Wilfred went on a speaking engagement to Canada or the United States, hundreds of people asked him how they could help. He always invited them to come to the mission and use whatever skills they had. And by 1905, hundreds had taken up the challenge. At times, the number of volunteers overwhelmed the full-time workers and tensions rose between the two groups, but it never bothered Wilfred. He was glad to introduce young people to the rigors of missionary service, and their enthusiasm and skills pushed the mission into new and exciting areas. One such volunteer was Jesse Luther, whom Welford met when he was on a lecture tour in New England. He visited a hospital in Marblehead, Massachusetts, and Jesse showed him around. Sometime before, she had been a patient at the hospital and was amazed at how boring a hospital stay could be. When she got well, she persuaded a doctor to allow her to start craft classes among the patients. She brought in weavers, knitters, and wood carvers to teach the patients their skills. The doctor soon noticed that these busy patients were happier and heal faster. When Wilfred saw what Jessie had achieved, he invited her to come to St. Anthony and bring her ideas with her. Jesse did come, and soon the hospital at St. Anthony had an industrial department attached to it that taught hooked rug making, ivory and wood carving, weaving, moscassin, and glove making, and like cutting, and the cutting and mounting of semi precious stones. Soon the local people in, became involved too, and many housewives learned new skills and were able to supplement their families' incomes through the long winter months. Wilfred's concern for the children had taken on a new form too. An orphanage was open at St. Anthony, and Wilfred had the words of Jesus, Suffer the little children to come unto me, painted in large white letters along the roof line. An English volunteer, an old friend of Wilfred's named Eleanor Storr, came to Newfoundland to look after the first six children who were housed in the orphanage. The only thing that could pull Wilfred away from the Labrador coast was the necessity to undertake speaking tours to raise increasingly larger amounts of money to keep the mission going. It was Easter Sunday, April 19, 1908, and Wilfred was just leaving church in St. Anthony when a man came running up to him across the snow. Dr. Grenfell, Dr. Grenfell, the man called. Wilfred stepped forward. Dr. 
Dr. Grenfell, the man said again, out of breath. We have come from Brent Island in Hare Bay. The boy, the boy you operated on two weeks ago is very sick. It, it be blood poisoning, I believe. You must come there and help him. Wilfred remembered the boy. He had operated on him for osteomyelitis. He immediately swung into action. I will get there as quickly as I can, he said as he ran off to his house to gather up his things for the journey. Brett Island was 60 miles to the south and it would take two days to get there. Once his eight dogs had been attached to his tomahawk, Wilfred was on his way. He also took with him his retriever, Jack, a small black spaniel. Jack bounced along beside the tomahawk as they set off. It was agreed that the men who had come from Brent Island would stay and rest themselves and their dogs before setting out again. By nightfall, Wilfred had made it to the small village of Locks Cove on the northern shore of Hare Bay. He spent the night with a family before setting out early the following morning. During the night, a stiff wind from the northeast had sprung up, causing the ice pack on the bay to break up into ice pans. Normally, Wilfred would have set out with his tomahawk and dogs across the bay, taking the most direct route to Brent Island, which lay close to the south shore of Hare Bay. Since his route across the ice pack was blocked, Wilfred made his way down the shore of the bay. Wilfred was several miles down the coast when he noticed that an ice bridge to a small uninhabited island in the bay was still intact. If he took the bridge to the island and then crossed the narrow sheet of ice between the island and the shore, he would cut a number of miles off his journey and arrive to treat his patient sooner. Wilfred called to his lead dog, Bryn, who veered in the direction of the ice bridge, leading the other dogs behind him. Soon Wilfred, riding on his tomahawk, was speeding across the ice bridge toward the islands. The dogs barking as they raced along. All was going well until Wilfred noticed that they had ventured onto shish ice. A thick, gooey layer of ice formed when the ice pans were buffeted together by the wind and small pieces broke off the edges. Suddenly, the tomahawk began to sink into the shish ice, making it almost impossible for the dogs to pull the sled. As the dogs slowed down, they too began to sink into the shish ice. Wilfred knew he had to do something, and fast. In an instant, he leaped off, he leaped off the tomahawk, pulling out his knife at the same time. With a swish of his knife, he cut through the walrus high traces that held the dogs to the sled. The dogs pulled free, and Wilfred grabbed the cut traces and held on as tightly as he could. The dogs pulled him through the shish ice until finally Bryn scrambled up onto a pan of ice. The other dogs followed, dragging Wilfred along with them. Shivering and wet to the bone, Wilfred clambered onto the ice pan. He knew he did not have time to think about how cold he was, not if he wanted to survive. The ice pan they were on was too small and was already beginning to sink with him and nine dogs on it. To make matter worse, the wind had shifted. It was now blowing from the northwest and was blowing the ice pans out to sea and away from the coast. Wilfred spotted another larger ice pan about 20 yards away. If only we could make it there, he muttered him to himself as he tied the dog traces around both wrists. He threw bin Bryn into the water in the hope that he could swim to the larger ice pan and lead the other dogs there, pulling Wilfred with them. But Bryn merely climbed back onto the ice pan he had been thrown from. Wilfred tried again and again with the same result. Bryn did not understand what Wilfred wanted him to do. 
Then he remembered Jack, his black spaniel tree retriever. Wilfred picked up a chunk of ice and threw it onto the larger ice pan. Go fetch! He ordered Jack. The spaniel sprang into action, sloshing its way across the shish ice to the ice pan. Stay! Wilfred commanded when the animal was safely across. Seeing Jack standing on the ice pan, Bryn suddenly got the idea. He leaped into the shish ice, the other dogs following him, tugging Wilfred along. A few minutes later, they were all safely standing on the ice pan, about 10 feet by 12 feet. Wilfred would have liked it to make it to an even bigger ice pan another 20 yards away, but by now he was too cold and he knew he had to get his body temperature up if he was to survive. He pulled off his wet clothing and wrung out each item. Then he put on one layer of clothing at a time and tr sat trying to use his body heat to dry the various items of clothing. While he did not get them completely dry this way, he managed to get them to where they were damp but not soaping wet. As he sat drying his clothes, Wilfred took his fur moccasin that reached all the way up to his thighs and cut the tops off them just above the ankles. Then with his knife, he split them open and using some of the walrus hide from the dog traces, he stitched together a kind of cape that he could drape around his so so shoulders for warmth. As he worked, the ice pan continued to be blown out across the bay. Wilfred knew that if he were blown all the way out to sea, he would never be rescued. The ice pan would be pounded to pieces by the heavy sea, dumping him and the dogs into the frigid ocean and cert certain death. As it was, Wilfred knew his chance of survival was slim. Not only was coal now his greatest enemy, but the coastline of Hare Bay was uninhabited, uninhabited between Locks Cove to the north and the coastal islands to the south. Even if the ice pan stayed in the bay, it was unlikely that anyone would see him and rescue him. But Wilfred would not let himself dwell on such things. Right now, he needed to do all he could to survive. The afternoon wore on and with it, Wilfred's attempt to dry his clothes as much as he could. Then, as afternoon shadows stretched long across the bay and the temperature began to plummet, Wilfred knew he had to do more to stay warm. It dawned on him that he would have to do the unthinkable. He would have to kill some of the dogs and use their hides as blanket against the biting cold. Wilfred thought about the grisly task for a while, but he could see no way around it. Once he had killed three of the dogs, Wilfred used lengths of the walrus hide traces to fashion the skins together into a blanket. The warmth he could receive had come at a high price. By now it was completely dark and Wilfred decided to try to see if he could get some sleep. He called his largest dog, Dog Doc to him and told the animal to lie down beside him. Wilfred then snuggled up to Doc for warmth. His dog skin blanket pulled tightly around him. Wilfred awoke several hours later, his fingers stinging from the cold. He thought he saw the sun rising, but when he looked closer, he realized that it was a bright full moon peeking through the clouds above. Once again, Wilfred took up his position beside Doc for warmth. By now, the dog was growling, thinking Wilfred was one of the other dogs wriggling beside him and waking him. <laughs> Wilfred tried to lie as still as possible. As he tried to drift off to sleep once again, the words of a hymn that he had sung as a boy back in Parkgate began to play over and over in his mind. 
My God, my Father, while I stray, far from home on life's dark way, O oh, teach me from my heart to say, Thy will be done. Wilfred did not know how long he had slept this time, but he awoke with the same stinging cold fingers. This time, though, an idea was pulsing in his head. He needed a pole and a flag. That way, maybe, just maybe, someone on shore might spot him and rescue him. His spirits were buoyed when the real when he realized the wind had died down and the ice pan was no longer floating out to sea but he was still more than five miles out from the closest point of land on Hare Bay. As he thought about a flagpole Wilfred realized that his dog's sacrifice would have to serve him yet again. It was not easy but working in the dark he at last managed to lash the dog's leg bones together with strengths of water's high to form a pole. By now the sun had risen. Wilfred pulled off his flannel shirt and attached it to the pole. He clambered onto his he clambered to his feet and began to wave the pole above his head. It wasn't very tall, but at least, um, where is it? It wasn't very tall, but at least it hoisted the flannel shirt flag five feet farther into the air. Wilfred waved as hard as he could his arms throbbed but he forced himself to carry on he told himself that this was his last chance if he stopped waving the flag right now someone might come along sh on shore in five minutes and not see it and know that he was trapped out on an ice pan in the bay he was cold and he was hungry. He knew he could not survive more than 24 hours on the ice. He had to keep waving. Eventually, Wilfred could not will himself to wave any longer, and he had to sit and take a break. After 20 minutes, he rose to his feet again. Now his feet feet and hands were so cold he could not feel them. They were simply lumps of flesh at the ends of legs and arms that he willed to move in who he willed to move in order to survive. Again, Wilfred waved the flagpole for as long as he could until once again he was forced to take a break. The third time he stood waving the flagpole, he noticed something in the distance. The light from the bright morning sun was glinting off something. It was something that seemed to be moving up and down. Wilfred tried to focus on it, but the glare of the sun of the ice had partially blinded him. He kept waving at whatever it was in the distance. Slowly, ever so slowly, the moving object assumed the shape of an of oars and then the lines of a rowboat. It was a boat. Wilfred could scarcely believe it. Four men were rowing the boat and a fifth was guiding them along the fissures in the ice. Doctor, you're alive. Stay where you are. We will come to you. One of the men called from, a row from the rowboat. Half an hour later, they were helping Wilfred on into the boat. Tears streamed down the men's faces when they saw that he was safe. They wrapped him up in a warm blanket and then poured him a cup of hot tea from a flask they had brought with them. Finally, the six remaining dogs climbed into the boat and the men began to row back to shore, following the fissures in the ice. Once they were ashore, Wilfred had, was given warm clothes to change into and the best bowl of stew he had ever eaten. During the boat ride back to shore, nobody said much, but now with warm clothes on his body and warm food in his stomach, Wilfred began to talk, telling those who had gathered to wish him well about his ordeal and how he had managed to survive. The men who was rest the men who had rescued Wilfred told him how lucky he was to be alive.
bless it. Several men from the village had take had made a trip down the lonely coast to collect some sea seals they had killed earlier and had left hanging until they froze. One of the men had said he saw a man adrift on an ice pan far out on the bay. At first, no one believed him, but when someone searched the bay with a spyglass, he spotted Wilfred adrift. But the wind then was too strong to launch a rescue attempt. The men had to wait until morning, all the while hoping that Wilfred would survive the night and not be blown out to sea. The following day, the men tied Wilfred onto a tomahawk and took him back to St. Anthony. Wilfred was eager to get back there and assure everyone that he was safe. Unfortunately, as his hand and feet thaw out, the pain was unbearable. His fingers and toe had suffered minor frostbite, and he could not walk or use his hands for much. Wilfred was welcomed enthusiastically at St. Anthony. Many in the community were convinced that he had died on the ice. When they saw him alive, they rushed to him and with tears in their eyes welcomed him home. The boy from Brent Island, whom Wilfred had been on his way to help, arrived safely in St. Anthony two, two days later. The breakup of the ice allowing him passage across the bay by boat. His blood poisoning was treated at the hospital and several days later he returned home to Brent Island, well on his way to making a full recovery. Glad to be safely home, Wilford was eager to be up and about again, but his frostbitten fingers and toes forced him to slow down while he recuperated. While he lay in bed recovering, Wilfred dictated an account of his ordeal on the ice to Jesse Luther, and his account was published as a book titled Adrift on Ice Pan. Once he had fully recuperated, Wilfred set out on his usual summer activities, traveling up and down the Labrador coast in the Stracana. The following year, Wilfred made a trip home to England. Much to his surprise, a drift on an ice pan had become a bestseller. Now when he spoke, bigger crowds than ever came to hear him. It seemed to Wilfred that everyone wanted to hear about his ordeal on the ice.